Hi, everyone. It's Erin again. Um, I'm the Roots Tech Marketing Manager. And today has been so wonderful. As you've already seen, we've been putting together live events for you all about women and mothers and genealogy. And we are thrilled and so excited to have our very own Rachel Crump Matus here with us, who is a Roots Tech Experience Manager. Rachel has actually worked for Family Search for over 10 years now, and she lives in Salt Lake City, Utah. And she is one of the most talented people that I've ever met. True story. She is an amazing chef, an amazing baker. I'm just going to sing your praises here, Rachel. She's an avid gardener and reader. Um, but she would say, and I would also agree, that one of her passions and top talents is taking care of people and helping making them feel loved. And I think that that summarizes who she is as a person so well. In addition to all of that and why we have brought her here for you today is that she is a family historian and genealogist and she has this talent in finding missing children and connecting them with women on the family tree. And so with Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Rachel, so that you can show us how to do this in Family Search and with other records and places. And um, please ask your questions in the chat. Um, we want to hear from you. We want to know what you want to know. And Rachel will answer. And if she can't get to it during the live, we'll go for about 45 minutes. We will answer your comments after, so don't hold back. So thanks, Rachel. All right, well, thank you, Erin, for the kind introduction. It was a little too kind, but I am excited to be here today and share a little bit with you. I am gonna be really forthright. There are many things about family history I am still learning. And uh, the beauty of what we get to do in these sorts of events is share ideas with each other. So if you have talents and skills on some of these topics, please give put comments in and let's teach each other as we go along. Um, but I am excited to talk about this topic. I feel like this is something that I uh, am almost called to do in, as I've started doing family history is helping to connect uh, those missing children that are in people's family trees. Um, as I was preparing, I, I found this incredible website uh, called the, uh, the Our World in Data Online. And they talked about uh, children that survived their childhood. Um, and how, uh, how, what mortality rates looked like for children around the world between 1800 and 2016. So as you look at this graph, you can see in this chart that most women uh, around the world expected at some point or another to bury their children. And while those mortality rates have gone way, way down in families, um, the pain and the hardship that went with people who did not know or who had to bury a child has never been less than what we would feel it today. Um, a couple of things I'll qualify on these graphs as you look at these numbers. Um, most, the way this, this is formulated is that they took the number of women estimated to be living in a country versus the number of children that were born and the number of children that died. So in that, we know there were many women who never were able to have children. And so these numbers and the numbers that someone might have buried um, are actually probably higher than even uh, than what's shown on these charts. But along with that, it also opens your eyes to that there are many of those children that probably haven't been recorded in family trees. So as we go today, I just wanted to share this because I found this quote. Um, and this is from a man, actually, who recorded his feelings in 1658 in his journal about the loss of his five-year-old son, so this child that they buried. And he said in his journal, here ends the joy of my life, five years and three days old only, but at that tender age for a prodigy of wit and understanding, for beauty of body and ver a very angel, for endowment of mind and incredible and rare hopes. And as I found those words, for as heartbreaking as they are, it was a reminder of how much every child needs to be remembered and how, how painful it was for those parents, no matter what age we lived in and how many they might have buried, that they want that connection with their family. And we as family historians have this incredible opportunity to record those children and help find them and, and preserve their legacy. Um, Rich John Evelyn 
uh, wrote this about his son, Richard, who was their firstborn, but he and his wife, Mary, had seven other children that have been recorded across history and only one made it to adulthood. And so I think about that and that agony, and it just points me towards um, wanting more and more to find and record those, those children that were lost. Um, as I talked about this topic with a few of my friends at the Family History Library and other researchers I know, I said, what are your best tips and tricks about this? And interestingly enough, one of my own colleagues said, she said, that's the only thing I do in my own family tree. Um, as she resources it and, and talks to it, she just, she says, this is where I feel drawn to often too. So I was glad that I'm not the only one that feels that compulsion uh, to seek out and look for those missing children. But they gave me a few tips and you're gonna see some of those in action as we get into some case studies as we go along today. But you will also see that um, uh, they have ideas here that go beyond uh, what I, I will have time to talk to uh, and I, some really great tips. So the first one, and I think a lot of you are probably familiar with this, but is look for the gaps between children of more than one year. Um, and, and again, the professionals that I consulted with said, if there's more than one year between kids, that's an automatic clue for them to go hunting for a missing child, a child whose birth is not recorded uh, in family trees. And, and in particular, we're gonna focus today on the family search tools and family search tree. Um, they also pointed out, look for more than just birth records. Birth records are actually a fairly recent phenomenon. So if you're looking more near term, birth records are a great place to start. But they said, as you get further back in time, those get fewer. So look at baptismal records, look for obituaries, cemetery records, um, death records and probate records. Each of those can be a place to look for and find more people uh, in the family tree. Um, the next thing uh, that was pointed out is in Latin American countries and other Spanish speaking countries, burial records are less common. So it's less likely that you would find a burial record uh, for a child. Um, and their, their hint was definitely look at baptisms because almost everyone made sure that their child was baptized. Um, another comment that they made, and they pointed this out for Latin America, but they also said, uh, then one of my British research expert friends said, don't be surprised. She chimed right in and said, don't be surprised if you find births before marriages or shortly after them. Uh, I think sometimes we think that we're looking for one year after a marriage happened to start looking for children, but don't limit yourself there. You can look before and shortly after uh, marriages that you may find things. Uh, for those of you that are doing U.S. research, they called out that the 1900 and the 1910 census can be gold mines of who are you looking for and, and are there possibilities? Because both of those census uh, lists in uh, the records listed children that were, how many children were born to a mother and then how many children lived. And so you get a better sense of, of how many might I be looking for in other records and forms. Um, take advantage of some of the views on family search. So we're gonna talk about research helps. We're gonna talk about um, some of the other tools that are on family search that will help uh, you to have clues what to look for and where. Um, I personally love the timeline view. It helps give me a great picture of, of someone's life and when to be looking for things. And the last tip that I would share from the pros is check in the households of other family members. So siblings, grandparents, and others that they may uh, have records of children that are not sitting in census records and other common records in people's households. So those are just a few tips. I've just rattled a whole bunch off. Um, I wanna share some possible tools on family search and dive a little bit deeper on that. And then we're gonna get into case studies where you can see a lot of these pro tips in action. So hang in there with me for just a few minutes and we'll get to see some of this and how does it look and work. Um, but really quick, just a few quick tools on family search to help you. Um, and I imagine that many of you are familiar with this. Um, the great thing about family search, even if you're keeping your own family tree and your research somewhere else, um, keeping your tree up in family search and, and working in that community tree 
is a great way to use some of these tools and get some of the, the tools and resources. And of course, it's always free every day on Family Search as well as our records. But this is the research help view of the fam, fam chart on Family Search. So if you log into Family Search and click on Family Tree, which you can see kind of in the top there uh, in the navigation bar on this, this shot of the screen, um, when you switch your view to the fam chart, you also have the rec option of switching views. So you can see uh, birth countries, you can see how many of them have memories, but one of my favorites is to look at this one that indicates where there is research help. So if you look across this, and, and this is my uh, second or third great grandmother, uh, third great grandmother, Susanna Proctor at the center here, you can see the purple boxes that indicate that there are research suggestions. And we'll dive into what that looks like in just a minute. You can see that there are record hints sitting there for those individuals. And if you're really into cleanup, you might wanna take a look at some of those data problems too um, and, and opportunities there to clean up uh, issues in the tree. But those are that view is really helpful to me, it, especially because I like to just kind of go where I feel like I can be helpful as I do my research on my own family and as I help other people learn to do theirs. The next view I wanna show you, this is another view of the tree, but this is the descendancy view of Family Search. Um, this is also a, a view that I look at that gives me an idea of where can, where do we have opportunities to look for those missing babies, to look for missing children or other opportunities. And my favorite thing is what you see right down here. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse as I'm hovering over it, but that blue re record hint and a purple research help side by side to me is always a gold mine. It's just like it calls out to me as an opportunity um, to go and, and learn more and, and help more with that individual. Um, once you get to somebody's personal page, um, you can dig in in the top right corner. You will also see those record hints and research help side by side. So as we look here at this one for Mary Jane Cochran, Cox Cochran, um, you can see here that she's got several record hints as well as a few research hints, including, um, and this is a great one to look at, um, is that possible missing child. So it the system will actually look and say, oh, there's a gap of more than three years between children, uh, or the last child was born more than three years before the mother turned 40. Um, and so those are research helps that are just right there. Laurie, thanks for the call out. I apologize for small font on your screen, but yes, we will make uh, this available to you so that you can get a look at some of these later um, and a recording. Um, but you can also see there uh, some other research helps that might be indicated for that person. All right, so just those are a few things that are designed for research help. The other one that I, I really like, as I mentioned earlier, is this timeline view. Um, and it's right up in the navigation of someone's person page on Family Search. And it's a great opportunity to look at kind of the timeline of somebody's life. And you can say, okay, they were born here. We have a residence uh, when they were 10 years old, 11 years old, what happened at 20, you can see the birth of their children. So this jump here between 1868 and 1872 is, is an opportunity for me to see it in a more vertical fashion. Oh, it looks like there's probably, a, there would likely be a child that should have, would have been born in that window between the birth of that first child and the birth of the second child, which actually here wasn't until 1875. You can see that uh, she buried that children, that child um, uh, early in his young life. The other thing I just call out on this, and I just learned this recently, is right up here in the top right of the timeline view, you can filter what it's showing. So we have settings to add historic events and things like that that add interest to the timeline, but you can reduce it down to use as a research tool that maybe makes it just a little bit simpler um, to see what you're looking for as you're going out and doing research. Um, the other thing you can see from this page is you can click into, if you click on any event, it will call it out on a map so you can see it there. 
Um, and you can access then the sourcing that's on the Family Search Person page that tells you a little bit more about that individual, which is great for a point of comparison um, as you're looking at and trying to help find more of those missing babies uh, and, and doing your homework. So, so those are just really quickly a few family search tools. I'm excited to share those with you and hopefully that's helpful to you um, as we dig in. But now I wanna kind of show you this in real life and some case studies. So I've got three case studies. Um, hopefully we'll get to all of them given the time that we have here today. I wanna to make sure we leave time to talk together and ask questions. But I also, um, I'm gonna put a qualifier on each of these case studies. You're gonna say, wow, Rachel only picked the easy ones today. I really, I did a lot today to just help make it to be simple to see what, what you're looking at. So I promise there's lots of things that, uh, that I know go into much deeper research and many of you have faced those challenges. But uh, for the sake of illustration, I've tried to pick some fairly simple ones to illustrate some of those opportunities. So the first one I'm gonna show you is Christian Christiansen Kortner from Norway. Um, he's actually one of my own ancestors uh, and my Norwegian ancestors have been my friends of late. They have, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, researching those lines of my family. And I'm so grateful for some really great Norwegian records that are available for free on Family Search um, and available on some of the other partner tools that are out there. Um, so in this case, we're going to talk a little bit about how to use a census record to find more um, and find those missing children. So we're going to dive in. You're going to see lots of screenshots here. Um, and, and so I'm just going to take you through the process on Family Search. If I start moving my mouse around like I'm scrolling on Family Search, please forgive me. I keep, I forget when I'm looking at pictures that I'm not actually on the site. But this is Christian's homepage. This is his person page on Family Search. Um, yes, it is Matthew, a, an impressive name. He's got a great name. Uh, Courtner, by the way, indicates what farm he was born on. So he was Christian's son, therefore Christian Christiansen. Um, but he was born in, and I'm going to butcher this name. Somebody will have to help me with my Norwegian later. Uh, Kongsberg, Norway in 1796. And based on what we know about him, we know that he was one of three children born to his parents, Christian Christiansen also, and his mother, Elsa, Catherine Daniel's daughter. Um, and I love they're great names here. But as I looked at that, I saw, oh, look, there's only three children in their tree. And the mother lived to the ripe age of, oh gosh, what was she, 40, almost 80 years old or 81 years old. So she had a nice long lifespan. Um, but she, uh, so it seems unlikely that she had only three children in her life. So this was kind of my hypothesis for, hey, I need to start looking for more children. Now, I will tell you that I found something a little different as I got going along, but I'm not done with uh, Elsa and Christian yet. I'm sure that there's more uh, to be discovered for them. But as we dig into Christian, the next thing that you're gonna see here is right up at the top right, there's a research hint um, indicating that Family Search thinks that there, he matches with a Norway census record from 1865. So as I'm looking at that, I'm gonna click into that record hint and it's gonna pop open this little side screen. And again, I'm sorry for the tiny font, um, but as I pop this open, I can see that the names match. I can see that birth year matches pretty closely, um, 1794, 1796 to his christen christening. Um, I love this word. I don't know what it means. I had to Google it and find out that he was the head of the household. Um, I, but in this census record, the first thing that popped out is maybe not was the location for him, because this is not what we know about him thus far uh, and his hometown of Kohnberg. So, of course, we I, I went in and viewed the record and popped it out to have that larger view of the record. And as you look down here towards the bottom, uh, they kindly called out to us that in Kongsberg, he was born in Kongsberg, but was living in Porsgrunn, uh, which is in a different part of Norway uh, at that point. So it I, it's not a rule it out yet, uh, simply because this, this birth record matched um, his own birth record and what we already know about Christian. 
Now, I love original documents. It always helps me to see them and to learn a little bit more. But right down here in the index, too, you can see that he was living with Amali Elizabeth Kortner and Caroline Martin Kortner. And their age difference was 37 and 11 years. So, uh, or their ages at the time of the 1865 census. So it logics easily that Amali would be uh, his daughter, and it's possible that Caroline would have been his daughter. But we need to dig in just a little bit more. Um, and I wanna see more as I dig into it. So as I zoomed in on that original record um, and that census record, one of the things that stood out, and again, I had to go uh, use a translation tool to help me understand it better, but we see Christian Christiansen Kortner listed there. He's listed his hometown um, and his birthplace in that census record. Um, but he's, the woman just below him is listed in column number three there as Jan's daughter or, or Han's daughter. And as I looked that up, it means his daughter. But underneath there, Caroline is listed as Hendis' daughter, which I learned uh, as I was working means her daughter. So what we see here is two missing children, but his daughter and then his granddaughter um, that appear on this census record with him. So remember that tip about don't be afraid to look in other people's households as you're going along. But as I went through and checked this out and looked at a couple of other possibilities, this felt like a great match to adding Amali to his family tree <laughs> and, uh, and getting her added into the family tree as a match for this family, um, using that census record as a source to help us find more. <clears throat> I wasn't totally comfortable at this point adding Caroline as his granddaughter, but as I dig, dug in a little bit further, um, what popped right up as soon as we added Amali to his tree, <coughs> excuse me, let me take a quick swallow of water, was two more research hints um, and records hints on family search, which as I dug into each of those led to finding more record hints, a mother's name, um, and these were church records that, that popped up. But these two hints surfaced a re marriage record for Christian. Um, and so we got to add his wife to the tree and wait for it, and an additional seven children to the tree um, that all popped up in those church records once I was able to connect mother and father together. Um, I will, as for those of you with eagle eyes, if you're looking up there at top at David, um, I don't know that David is a match for this family. There's more research to be done there. So don't worry, I haven't left off on the Christiansons quite yet. But also in the digging, it, it came through that a uh, marriage record for Amalie and uh, Caroline's father and a birth record for her. So Bree, you guessed it. She is the 11-year-old granddaughter of, of our friend Christian Christiansen. And so in that one story and one child, it helped unwind uh, the knot just a little bit to finding six more children in the tree and their church records, as well as the parent, uh, the mother, and getting her added to the family tree so we could connect uh, those mothers and children, as we're talking about some of our female ancestors today, um, and a spot for me that I know I can go and do some more research as I look at his mother uh, and siblings and the next couple of generations of this branch of my family tree. So uh, again, census records, great tool. Um, and those record hints that are an awesome way to, to kind of get connected on to more opportunities to adding names to the family tree and, and building out those, those opportunities. Um, all right, so the next one that I'm gonna point out, and this is a US research-based uh, case study. Um, where I used, in this case, we used the brand new published collection of Numident records. And these are a social security record index uh, that has just recently been published on Family Search, um, And it proved out to be really useful as well as cemetery records um, that are available to get involved with. Um, Brie, I think your question is census is only free if it's hundred years old. So really depending on which country 
we're talking about, but I know that Family Search, all records on Family Search are free every single day. If you're looking on other platforms, they might charge you for near, more near term or far term uh, record opportunities, but those those census records are free on Family Search. So, um, and for the U.S., going back to the 18. 40 census, if I remember correctly. All right, so as we're digging in here, um, let's take a look at Catherine Hessler. So thanks to my friend Annie, uh, who has uh, kindly allowed me to help her learn to do some family history. Uh, this example comes from her family tree. Um, and Catherine uh, was born in 1896 in Germany, but she was an immigrant uh, to the United States. Uh, and she married another immigrant, a man named Philip Urich, who was of Polish ancestry um, and German heritage as well. They both immigrated into the United States. But as I looked at their tree, you'll see that we have the two of them, but only one child listed on their family tree. And so it's, again, an opportunity to be looking for more and more opportunities within this tree and, and opportunities to, to add family uh, and remember them and preserve their lives uh, and their, their personal history and legacy in family the family tree. So as you look, again, we've got a, res a couple of research hints uh, and record hints right up at the top. Uh, the Numident record, as well as a New York marriage record, and a little reminder of another uh, research help, which is that there are no sources currently attached to Catherine. So lots of opportunities on this page to kind of help uh, preserve that legacy. So we're going to dig into some of those and what we can learn from them uh, as we look at it. So let's go a little deeper here. So the first one I'm going to that I clicked into was that marriage record because um, I wanted to make sure that we were talking about the same Catherine Hessler. She's listed there as Kathy Hessler, um, but Kathy. Um, in this case, we see that a marriage record that marries her to Philip Urich, a little bit of a spelling difference, but uh, the same fellow uh, who was the son of Adolf and Sophia. Um, and we have a listing for her parents, uh, which was currently not listed in the family tree. Um, and so again, this is an opportunity to add, but their marriage record and the locations, the names, the family relationships all match. But Kathy married uh, Philip at the ripe old age of 17 in upstate New York, um, and they started having a family. And again, we have a record of one son named Elmer in the family tree, but it's highly probable that they would have had more children um, and, and that Elmer might have even been a younger child, uh, given that their marriage year was uh, 1913. So that also gives us a time frame to start looking for where might their kids have been born? So as I look at this, I did want to make sure that this matched up with Philip. So I, I looked at, at the record hint for Kathy, um, at Catherine alongside of his, and, and you have the magic of PowerPoint here where I could overlay it. But in this case, it was, I had multiple screens open, which is a huge help to me as I looked at this. But all of the information really matched up with what I know about Philip in the family tree right now. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna attach that, we attach that record hint to her and verified their marriage. But ne the next thing on there was that Numident record and that opportunity to look at those numerical identification files that have just recently been published. So as you open that up, the first thing that you see up here is Catherine's name at the top, um, but right underneath is a child of hers, Frederick Philip Urich. So Philip being a family name, that's a good clue that he's a member of that family and born to her. Um, and that this is a matched relationship here. Um, but it also, as you go down further in this, it lists the father's name and the location and all of those things match. So this allows us to add one more record um, and one more child to their family tree and attach that family together. The next thing though, that as I was looking at Philip's page, I saw another research hint there of a find a grave index. And this is, I love find a graves um, because when you get a well-documented cemetery, often on find a grave, what you'll find 
is listings of parents, siblings, and children that have also all been buried in that cemetery. Um, the other thing that we're going to see here as we dig into this one, um, let me just pop this screen up here so you can see it, is this note on, on the pop-out that this record contains a biography. So I automatically knew that I wanted to jump over to find a grave and view that record um, because those biographies are so helpful and useful as we look. So as I jumped over here, here we are in this, the Herkimer County Cemetery, um, the Mountain View Memorial Gardens uh, in New York. The whole, and, and inside of that, we can see just a really quick memorial that's been written, um, biography written about Philip. And, and so let me just pop this up and make it just a little bit bigger for all of us. But he was the son of Adolf and Sophie Baum Urich. He was on February 1st, 1915. He married Catherine Hessler, which ties back uh, to that marriage record that we just looked at and where they got married. And they had two sons, Elmer and Frederick. So we found Elmer and we found Frederick. That's awesome. But two daughters, Anne and Helen, which are not currently listed in the family tree. So this is a great reference point to go looking and hunting for is there historical evidence that corroborates this biography. Um, it also lists out the death date of Sophie um, and lists his second wife, Gertrude, um, and who his survivors were uh, at the time that this was written. So all of this uh, led me to think, oh, I've got more people to go looking for uh, in their family tree. So as, as I was digging around, again, ran into a census record. This is the 1930 U.S. Census. Um, and I'll zoom in on this. I know it's handwritten, so it's a little bit hard to read on your screen. Um, but if you could zoom your screen bigger right now, you would see that Philip Urich is listed there with Catherine, his wife, and his daughters, Anna and Helen, as well as those two sons, Frederick and Elmer, um, and listed in the family tree. So two more kids that have been added and researched in and have corroborating records that help us to know that they were a part of that family. So three kids added in this case to that family tree. Um, so I, it's just, it's a great find to find those more people and, and a great feeling to know that, that their legacy has been preserved. Now, for some of you, again, with eagle eyes, you're like, wow, those people could still possibly be living. I did actually do all the homework to make sure that they are also deceased um, before I added them publicly on family search. So uh, there's all kinds of sources and records. So Annie, you've got a few more cousins uh, on your family tree now. All right, one more quick case study and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, this one is Maria Lu Perez. Um, and Maria is, is just a quick case study in baptismal records as we mentioned earlier. Um, so Maria is uh, was born in Mexico. Uh, we know that, but we know nothing else of her, except that she was the mother of at least four children with a man named Felice Ruiz Ruiz. Um, and all of her children, as we dig into the sources that are attached to her, um, were christened in the same church in Bustamante, Mexico. Um, and, and so that is a great clue to help understand the context of who she is. So here I've switched over to the timeline view that I mentioned earlier. It's an opportunity to look across her life and we see a birth of a child. Um, sorry, we see only births of children in this timeline because we now have no vital dates for Maria, but we see her first child that we have listed born in 1802, the next one in 1805. Um, so there's a three year gap between child number one and number two a seven-year gap between child number two and number three, and a five-year between child number three and number four. So again, each of those, those gaps is an indicator that there's an opportunity to go looking um, for more children in the family tree and to add. So here again, we were blessed with a, a record hint. It's always good to start with, with the uh, fruit right there uh, on uh, that's easy to pick. And so as we click this open, it gets us into a christening record, again, from the same church, San Miguel Archangel in Bustamante, Mexico, um, according to the index, 
with the same father, with the same listed names, um, and and that christening record for 1807. And if you remember, I'm going to go back a slide. We're going to look at that timeline view really quickly. Go back two slides, actually. Um, we don't have a child listed anywhere between 1805 and 1812. So this feels like genealogical eureka to me um, as we dig into this and we find and add one more child to her tree through these christening records for Jose Andreas Ruiz, uh, another son in her family tree. Um, and so this great christening record and, and it's a beautiful document, but also hard to read. I should have gotten a screenshot of that. But as we zoom into it, you can see a little bit more of those details there that they match all of the records for her other children. This is from her sources page. Um, as we added him uh, into the family tree and to be remembered alongside of those of his siblings that have been found and clues to find some more. So, so those are three different case studies and a few different techniques that used to help find those missing kids. I know we breezed through that really quickly, but hopefully that sparked some ideas for you and things that you might go looking for that can help uh, in your family tree as you continue to hunt for missing children um, and helping families to be connected together uh, on, on the tree. Uh, so yeah, so now I'd love to hear from you tips and tricks that you have or questions um, that uh, have come up uh, as it's uh, as, as we've been talking here today. So I yes. see uh, Aaron's back. Thanks, Aaron, for rejoining us. Hello. Yes, <laughs> we've had so many good questions. And some of them I've noticed you've answered along the way. And your presentation is always is so helpful. So thank you. We're, we'll put up those that we don't think have been answered. That Bree Davis asks, but census is only free if it's 100 years old. So Do you know about that, Rachel? Again, I, I think this varies a little bit by country and your access. But all of the U.S. censuses are free on Family Search and available from 1950 back to, I believe, 1830 is the first U.S. census that's available on the site um, and general census. There are also state census records. Um, I wasn't aware until I started doing family history that in many states, they took a census record often every five years. So, by the way, there's another hint. Um, you know, we look at the federal census in a lot of countries, but you might look for state or county censuses too, that were taken a little bit more frequently because 10 years is a long span between finding children. Um, so 1830 to 1950, each of those censuses is published and freely available on Family Search. Um, other countries, I know in, in the UK, 1831 um, through, I wanna say 1920 is available. Uh, on Family Search and other free websites that you can check out. Uh, there's there are some British censuses that you now have to find to look at the original document. Indexes are available on Family Search. Um, original documents are available on uh, on uh, Find My Past through the London National or the the UK National Archives. Um, so those are things that. Uh, our opportunities to look for there. So, but there are, there are census records all over um, uh, that you can look for in different countries. So it, it lots of different ones. So what do I look up to see how I'm related to the person on my card? Oh, that's a great one. Let me see if I can actually, I let me pull up a screen. I'd lo love to demonstrate that for you. So give me just a second, to pull that over. Let me open family search up. I closed a whole bunch of tabs before we started today, just in case any of you saw how cluttered my, my desktop is. But uh, let me just find an opportunity here to show uh, that relationship because I love that card. It really is powerful to show how you're related to someone. So let me know, Aaron. Are you seeing a family search screen? Did that come up where you can see it? No, but on the back end, we have Annie who probably needs to put it into the, the chat or sorry, okay. the screen. All right. Let me find you. 
Sorry, I was hoping I had shared my window, not just my deck. Um, and I tried to- No worries. And while you're that. looking for that too, um, as Rachel was mentioning, those census records are free on FamilySearch. And it's also free to set up an account on FamilySearch if you haven't done that already. Um, it Absolutely. doesn't cost you anything. Okay, really quickly here. So hopefully now that I'm resharing, are you seeing it now, Erin? Yes. yes. And I'm yep. it now. That's great. All right. So as I look at this, um, so here's Christian, Christiansen Kortner with his fabulous name that we talked about earlier. Um, so if you've wondered how he's related to me, um, right here under his name, I can click on this and it pulls up this beautiful chart and then it's going to zoom way out. So none of you can see it right now, but you can see what my relationship is to him. So by the way, he's my first cousin six times removed. Um, I, I, I feel connected to him in every way now as I've helped uh, expand his family and preserve their memory. Um, but we have a shared grandfather going back uh, seven generations on my family tree. So really simple to just click on that view my relationship button. Um, and I love that feature. I also love when I'm helping someone else to find out if the person I'm helping is related to me as well. And so Aaron and I got lucky this year and found out that we're actually third cousins, much closer than we expected. So we've had got to talk about our shared family line. So that was really awesome. fun. Yeah. And anybody can do that to what Rachel's mentioning. We have a feature where you can find out relatives near me and you can see if you're related to the people near you, if you both have a family tree. So it's a really cool thing to try. Awesome. Hopefully that helps, Diana. Yeah, absolutely. So here's a great question from Catherine Livingstone on Facebook. Any tips for finding family members in countries with poor record keeping? I have been trying to find my grandmother's sisters who lived and died in Haiti as children, but I'm having very little luck. Yeah, that is trickier. So there are a couple of things um, with those countries. First is if you can find connections to relatives that are still living there that might have a chance actually seeing records. I do know that we have been working, we Family Search, uh, have been partnering with the government in Haiti to get land records and other uh, records, uh, census records and general statistic records, birth, marriage, and death. Um, but uh, church records are a powerful tool as well. Uh, church records tended to be kept in those countries better than government records until recent years. And so if you can find access to church records, that's a great opportunity. Um, I know it's difficult in countries, especially when they're not readily published. But uh, one of the things I love best about working family with family search is that we have a goal of, of you having access to your family wherever they are um, and wherever you are. And so as we continue to negotiate those, you'll see more and more uh, records in countries that are maybe a little bit more forgotten too, wherever we can find records. Um, the other thing you might try to is DNA and and doing DNA testing with some of those partners. It's less common, but it's an opportunity to trace and and find people that might be descendants of those sisters uh, who lived and died in Haiti. And, and what do they know about your family that you don't know? It's amazing what different people carry down family lines and the stories and traditions um, that they know that uh, I'm always surprised. We have a colleague that he and I have a, a shared family line as well. And I knew nothing about that line. And he could recite, he recited me hours of great stories and history on that particular family um, because it's one that he was taught and my family didn't share those stories as much. So um, my branch of the family. I'm so glad you brought up DNA. Last week, we did a whole day of DNA learning. If you go to rootstech.org and you can search on DNA Day. And there was actually a lot about how to find missing family members through DNA. And so what Rachel mentioned, you can learn more about the specifics on how to do that there. And that's awesome. Um, so I, I didn't notice where the, and we're about at time, but I, there was a question earlier and I don't remember where it was about, can I hire someone to do my family history and genealogy? I thought it might be a good place for you to talk about. Um, there we go. Bree asked that question and Bree, thank you so much for being so active in this live. You've asked some great questions. Um, I know that our family search library offers consultations and Rachel knows all about that. So for those of you that 
are not sure to where be, where to begin or start, Rachel, can you kind of point them in that direction? And we'll Absolutely. put the link to where we'll to go the, in yeah, the chat. Yeah, definitely share. But one of the awesome things about Family Search is that um, we are we have wonderful professional researchers in our library, some of the very best in the world. And one of the great things that happened in the pandemic that forced us to approach things differently is that those professional genealogists that are work out of the library were hungry to be helping people still. And so they created an online consultation program and you can schedule a consultation with a professional in whichever country or homeland that you're looking to research. You can do one about DNA or adoption. Um, the experts will schedule uh, 20 minutes with you free online. They work at crazy hours. So those of you who are up at different times as we are, um, they will still make time for you in other times, but they'd love to take your questions and they will help point you and teach you how to keep going on your own too. So rather than it being, oh, well, let me go do it for you and you don't get to learn. They will show you the next steps and help you figure out and you'll work side by side on doing it. And you can do it many times over. So it's not, here's your free consultation. And then next time you have to pay us or you have to get a subscription to them, they'll keep doing it. Uh, if you are looking for a professional researcher and you want someone to do that, uh, there are great sites out there and on rootstech.org in our expo hall, we have a number of professional researchers that uh, have their services and their website's available that you can link into it um, and check them out if you want to have somebody else doing that legwork for you. Um, but those research consultants in the Family History Library, always free to you. Um, like I said, they'll schedule appointments and they'll help you to learn and keep going. Bree, I see you've got one more question I'll squeeze in. Family Search does not do DNA testing, um, nor do we upload it to our website, but we uh, We've got a great page, uh, familysearch.org slash DNA, that teaches you the basics about testing and gives you some ideas of what test might be the right one for you. Yeah, such great questions today. And I don't know about you guys, but I think we should have Rachel back because I could listen to you and learn from you for hours. <laughs> but we're at time and I'm so sad about it. But thank you so much for all of you that viewed and joined and please share this with people who might be looking to do this kind of work um, and connect missing children to their families on the family tree. Rachel, as always, thank you so much for joining us and giving us all of your knowledge and experience that you have in these areas. Um, we're so grateful. These videos will continue to be available on all of our social platforms, wherever you've been watching and on our YouTube and on Tech.org as well. So you can go there to watch these and other great classes. And thanks again for joining us and have a great week.